respecto de la sesión de ayer. Otra vez de la sesión de ayer. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the this uh, 19th International Conference on Electrical Engineering and Computing Science and Automatic Control CCE uh, Conference. Uh, this is the second day. Uh, we are start. We are going to start with. Uh, uh, session uh, of semiconductor devices. Uh, the speaker is Jose Josue Rodriguez Pisano. And the uh, topic is study of sensing properties of zinc terrorite synthesized by mechanosynthesis for detecting, detecting gas CO. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> Well, good morning, everybody, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jose, uh, Jose Rodriguez Pisano. I am a PhD student of the program in nanoscience and nanotechnology of Simvestab Zacatenco. And today I'm going to talk about my project titled A Study of the Sensing Properties of Sintelorate Synthesized by Mechanosynthesis for Detecting a Carbon Monoxide. The content of this presentation includes a short introduction, the experimental methodology, results, and the conclusion. As an introduction, we know that the carbon monoxide is one of the most dangerous uh, chemical compounds. It's a, a pollen that of these, uh, the sources of these uh, chemical compounds, the principal sources sources are the industrial emission and on route uh, vehicles and other kind of uh, sources as a gas application, forest fire, power generation and biomass burning. This uh, chemical compound, uh, it can cause uh, many different diseases and even the death. That is the uh, important of try to control or detecting it because we can see it we can hear it or we can smell, but we can detect it. For the, the detection of these uh, chemical compounds, there are many uh, materials applied as a CO sensors. These materials include uh, metal oxides, carbon nanotubes, do, do, do to the materials and conductor polymers but it is necessary to try to study other kind of materials for these applications. Um, it is necessary to explore novel sensing materials to detect carbon monoxide, uh, as I said. In this sense, we are interested in studying the sensing properties of the zinc telluride. 
In this world, zinc telluride powders were synthesized using a green uh, chemical method through mechanosynthesis in the planetary bulb milling, using pure zinc and tellurium uh, powders as precursors. The resultant melted uh, zinc and tellurium powders were used to manufacture zinc uh, pellets for sensing CO at different uh, temperatures and gas uh, concentrations. But how it uh, how does work um, uh, sensing uh, material for this application? Well, the sensing mechanism uh, mechanisms is uh, well is the following is in the this slide. We know or we know that a uh, surface of a semiconductor is oxidized because of for the interaction of the oxygen atmosphere the atmosphere. Uh, that is present in the atmosphere, and this uh, causes that the sur uh, the surface of the semiconductor has a positive uh, charge on the surface. When a uh, gas, a uh, reductant gas, as a um, carbon monoxide, interact with the surface of the semiconductor, the charge of the uh, semiconductor change to a negative um, charge, and this. A changing of the charge in the surface of the semiconductor, it can be measured uh, for detecting this uh, carbon monoxide. But uh, what happened, or what is uh, the process, the chemical process that happened in the um, surface of the semiconductor? Where, well, I, the oxygen uh, it's absorbed on the surface on the semiconductor as you can see in the figure in the letter A. And this uh, oxygen can be react with the uh, with the carbon monoxide as a reductant uh, gas. And this reductant gas reacts to convert uh, into a carbon dioxide and to set free electrons. That means that the resistance of the surface of the semiconductor is going to decrease. And we can measure that change in the in the res in the electrical resistance in the on the surface of the conduct the semiconductor. Well, as a, well, the methodology for the mechanosynthesis process is the following as in this slide. Uh, we use a uh, zinc powder and tellurium powder precursors with an stoichiometric radio of one to one. We use a weight radio ball charge to precursors. 10 to 1, and these precursors on the bulb were added into a milling jar. This milling jar is placed into the molly in the milling um, machine. And with the next condition, the milling time, total milling time was 10 hours with a cycle of the 5 to 5, uh, 5 uh, minutes for molding to 5 million, uh, minutes for resin. With a speed of uh, 500 RPM, the reaction that happens inside of the molin is the next: the zinc, uh, the powder of the zinc and the tellurium powder uh, solid reacts with for the um, high uh, energy that it uh, happens inside of the jar, and it's uh, this uh, re uh, precursor react to form the zinc telluride solid. Uh, for uh, after the the zinc telluride synthesis for the milling process, milling process uh, 400 milligrams of the zinc telluride powder were uh, taken, and we made a uh, one. a thin telluride pellet with a uh, one millimeter uh, thin of this zinc uh, telluride powder and a diameter of seven nanometers. We use a hydraulic pressing uh, machine with an optimal pressing conditions of uh, 15 tons for five minutes for make these uh, pellets. 
After that, we uh, measure uh, the electrical resistance in gas uh, CO with anomic with anomic contacts were fabricated with high purity silver paint, and this is an schema uh, an illustrate or a photo for the equipment for the sensing CO um, uh, pellets. Well, as a result, we have that we took the diffractograms of the zinc telluride powders, processed it and different milling times. We can observe that the all in the all of the diffractograms show the characteristic peak diffractions for a zinc telluride symblenda phase and with a preferential growth 111 plane. And also we can, uh, or it can be observed other peaks to refer on other zinc phases as a zinc oxide and zinc telluride. Uh, we measure the crystal or we estimate the crystal crystallite size of the zinc telluride powder processes at different milling times. We can or it can be observed that it is an, a trend that when we uh, increase the milling time, the crystal size increasing. Uh, we study the morphological properties of the zinc telluride powders by some analysis, and in all the cases, uh, the materials present um, conglomerate particles, and this can be caused for the high uh, energy that causes the molding press, uh, the molding processes, milling processes. Um, we uh, study the surface morphology of the zinc telluride pellets with uh, atomic force microscopy. And we saw that all the, <clears throat> all the pellets has an irregular grain size and uh, the roughness of each, uh, the roughness of the samples was increasing with the time of milling, with the milling process. We uh, estimate or we measure the sensing properties of these uh, zinc telluride pellets. And we can observe, well, these uh, sensing properties were measured to, re to register the resistance versus the CO concentration in ppm at different uh, temperatures of the different condition of temperature operation operation and we can uh, or it can be observed that the um, the materials has a good response at lower temperatures at lower temperatures and the resistance decrease with the time of the milling process in all the cases uh, we estimate the sensitivity of a function of a CO concentration of, for the uh, zinc telluride pellets, and we can observe uh, this is the sensitivity as a function of the CO concentration for the pellets at uh, an operating temperature of 100 Celsius degree. That was the best uh, temperature uh, operating temperature condition that we can saw in the last slide. And we can uh, see that the, when we uh, increase the time of the milling process, the sensitivity uh, increases uh, considerably. And that means that these materials can be operated at low temperatures and we can apply for this uh, sensing or this material can we apply uh, for the sensing uh, carbon monoxide. As a conclusion, we have that the zinc telluride was synthesized by means of a green synthesis method, mechanosynthesis, using only powdered zinc and tellurium, tellurium as precursors at different high energy breathing times. The results of the X-ray diffraction characterization confirm the presence of the zinc blend type cube phase of the zinc telluride with a preferential growth orientation on the 1-1 plane. Additionally, uh, well, we saw phases as uh, corresponding to ox uh, zinc oxide and zinc telluride were observing these uh, species for the oxidation of the precursors by the presence of the oxygen inside um, or within the air atmosphere of the breathing jar. The same images in all the cases show particle size less than two nan 200 nanometers with particles of irregular morphology 
forming agglomerates of the material. And the AFM micros, uh, micrograph showed surfaces with irregular grain size. In the case of the carbon uh, monoxide sensing analysis, all the samples presented a good response to the gas at the different operating temperatures. The samples processed at time greater than four hours, presenting high sensitivity values at an operating <coughs> temperatures of 100 Celsius degree. The pellet prepared with the synthelluride powder synthesis with uh, eight hours of breathing, presenting the highest sensibility, sensibility value. The linearity recorded in the response of the CO is a favorable aspect that will allow direct calibration curves to be obtained. And the results obtained in this work show the potential of these materials in, for its application in the area of gas sensing. And uh, well, we want to or uh, we appreciate the technical support that received received from the uh, Dr. Jorge Roque for the same analysis from the Advanced Laboratory of Electronics Nanoscopy from Simvestab, also for the uh, Ingeniero Miguel Luna Arias for the technical support, uh, for the uh, Maestra Georgina Ramirez for the ASM analysis. May also for the Maestro eh, Adolfo Tavira and Dr. Azok Ricari for the great characterization and for the scholarship obtained from the Consejo Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología, CONACYT. Uh, this is some reference and well, thank you for your attention. If, if you want, uh, if you have any questions, I can answer. Thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Rodriguez. So hope the presentation is open for uh, discussion. Some question, and if not, we have a bit of time. I have one or two questions. Yes. Sir. Could you put in a page six? Uh, you you have mentioned uh, in a página six mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, preparation. Uh, this is a space charge related transport mm -hmm. in a figure eight. At this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is the space charge region you are considering? There are some amount of a space charge, the distance from the surface to the grain. Uh, do you have some data or not? Or what is a possible a space charge layer? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. not sure. Because you uh, talk about the grain size. Uh -huh. okay? That is from about 20 to 70 nanometers. Yes. So, what could be? Uh, possible space charge region because you are explaining the transport. I think that the thick well the thickness mm. it could be a, a thin a thin thickness or a lower thickness that because well the oxygen is absorption on this on the surface of the semiconductor no? mm. so I think that only well the the most or the nearer um, uh, bonding of this uh, uh, material, semiconductor material, can be uh, catch the oxygen on the sur on the surface, and I think that only the first uh, slice of the of the semiconductor can be react with that mm. oxygen for try to detect in the the carbon monoxide. Okay, I, I understand okay. the mechanism for uh -huh. detecting. But uh, it's related to the size and the possible space charge uh, layer. Ah. Also, you are talking about short well, barrier. Okay. We mm. uh, smaller size <coughs> of this. I think that the I, the area is going to be higher, mm. and I think that the sensing property is going to be increasing. Mm. Mm. Okay. I think about uh, the specifically uh, or the date data for this, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure, but I think mm -hmm. that it could be okay. or, or it could be better for nano materials mm -hmm. that has a smaller uh, size mm -hmm. and the area is going to be mm -hmm. bigger. Mm -hmm. It's probably difficult to mm -hmm. explain all of the details is yeah. regarding also the short key barrier. What is the height of a barrier, for example? Mm -hmm. That is very difficult problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Yeah. Ah. Uh, Arti, uh, ah, Arhati, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question uh, concerning the the, the 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 formation of uh, agglomerates. How can these agglomerates can influence the uh, sensitivity of the device? How the agglomerates can be affected for the sensitivity? Can the agglomerates influence the sensitivity of the device? Well, I think that well, uh, we have different kind. Of, these agglomerates form after the process of the milling process, but we compress the powders with a hydraulic press. So this means that the these agglomerates well can be to more closer each other, and maybe the the grains on the surface of the pellet going to be more irregular, and the size of these grains going to be uh well bigger than the small that we can saw in the uh, same analysis. So I think that we can affect if the the grains uh, the grain size are bigger the electrical uh, response going to be down uh, or decrease. Thank you. Okay, now is just on time. So uh, thank you very much for thank that. You. The title is a new germanium gauge infrared photo transistor based on doping engineering aspect, photo detection properties and circuit level investigation. So please, uh, Heike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is it clear? So, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Farhati Hisham from University of Batna. So, I will provide the main results of my work entitled new germanium gate infrared phototransistor based on doping engineering aspect for detection properties and circuit level investigation. So the presentation outlines are given as follows. First, we start with an introduction describing the importance of uh, phototransistors for, uh, for optical wireless communication systems. Secondly, we we show the device structure and then the modeling methodology used to model the device performances. And then the result and discussion are given in the fourth section. And finally, we conclude with some remarks and future perspectives. Optical communication systems has received a great deal of attention during the last few years due to its large, uh, due to its ability for offering large <clears throat> large bandwidth so optical communication systems are divided into three principal uh, stages the first one is the optical source the second one is the transmitter and the third one uh, and the last one is the receiver the receiver is <coughs> is combines the photo detectors, trans transimpedance amplifier, and series of amplifiers to achieve a high electrical logic cell. So the, the use of a photo detector, uh, on, only a photo detector requires a high, uh, a huge uh, circuit, uh, which is based on amplifiers to achieve a high, the highest level uh, at the logic gate. So 
uh, an enormous increase of the power consumption is uh, is uh, is uh, achieved. To deal with this problem, researchers have uh, proposed a new structure, which is the phototransistor. The phototransistor is a simple combination between a MOSFET platform and uh, a photodetector. So the sensitive gate is implemented uh, on the top of the silicon dioxide of the MOSFET transistor, which can enable getting rid of power budget, suppressing uh, wire capacitance, offering the CMOS compatibility and uh, the receiverless property. So the main aim of this work is divided into three, uh, into, into four principal points. Uh, firstly, proposing a new phototransistor design for optical communication systems, developing numerical models for the proposed device, then evaluating the performance of the proposed phototransistor with respect to the conventional one. And lastly, assessing the performance of an optical inverter based on the proposed device. This figure shows the proposed optically controlled field defect transistor uh, based on doping engineering aspect. Uh, we can notice from this figure that uh, a MOSFET platform is used with a germanium gate, uh, photosensitive gate. The proposed strategy to, to enhance the device performance is to use uh, two regions with different doping levels in the gate, in the germanium gate near the source side and near, uh, the first one is near the source side and the second one is near the drain side. So the photogenerated carrier in the germanium gate will modulate the channel electrostatic behavior, which can in turn enhance the diode current capability under elimination. So in order to model the device performance, we have used it uh, uh, Silvaco software uh, based on the diffusion mechanism and uh, find difference time domain method. Uh, this choice is mainly due to the complex behavior at the interface between, uh, between the germanium and the silicon dioxide layer. Uh, the complex interface also between both suggested germanium regions uh, with uh, the similar doping levels, so the analytical model is untractable. So uh, we need for a new numerical modeling based frameworks. In order to assess the performance of the device, the the <clears throat> the current voltage characteristics associated with both devices, investigated devices with and without doping engineering aspect are given in this figure. Uh, it can be shown from this figure that the proposed device exhibits a high photoresponse uh, photo photo uh, photocurrent as compared to that of the conventional device for several applied optical powers. Besides, the device demonstrates a very low dark current due to the use of the doping engineering aspect. This is mainly attributed to the role of doping engineering aspect in promoting better optical control of the channel electrostatic behavior. Where the use of dual doping region in the germanium sensitive layer leads to enhance the transport of the photo and of the photo induced carrier in the germanium gate. Aiming at assessing the performance of the device, uh, we have implemented the proposed device in uh, an inverter circuit, uh, optical inverter circuit, which is given in this figure, and the output, uh, the the output voltage as uh, as a function of the optical signal, are shown in this figure using different 
uh, doping engineering combination. It can be seen from this figure that the proposed device with dual doping regions can show high switching capabilities as compared to the conventional structure with uniformly doped germanium gate, promoting enhanced optical gain values. This is mainly due to the use of doping engineering strategy allowing better optical swing characteristics. Besides, the use of an optimized germanium gate can allow achieving near one volt at off state condition, indicating its uh, better noise characteristics. To further investigate the device performances, uh, we have analyzed the, 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 the effect of the doping engineering uh, on the on the gain on the uh, device figure of minutes, including gain and noise margin. It can be seen from this figure that the proposed device with doping engineering paradigm offers superior optical gain values over a large input voltage window. This improvement is due to the enhanced photosensing characteristics of the device when doping engineering strategy is included. In addition, the proposed phototransistor stector allows reaching an enhanced optical gain at lower operating voltages, thus emphasizing its ability for offering low power consumption and, and also low noise effects. So for the concluding remarks in this work, a new infrared phototransistor based on optically controlled field effect uh, device with doping engineering aspect is proposed and numerically investigated. Atlas two-dimensional simulator is used to accurately model the photoelectrical behavior of the proposed device. Then a circuit level investigation is carried out to analyze the switching capabilities of a proposed device as compared to the conventional one. It was found that the proposed device offers enhanced photoresponse and gain at low power optical powers while maintaining a low noise effects and power consumption. So it is revealed that the proposed device shows excellent photoresponse characteristics, making it highly appropriate for the emerging optical wireless communication systems. For future works, the present work can be extended by developing analytical models for the, for the, for the proposed device with doping engineering strategy, uh, introducing metaheuristic techniques for performing global optimization and selecting the appropriate doping engineering profile that can offer the highest performances seems also of great importance. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Hakim, for your presentation. And uh, now the paper is open for question, uh, discussion. Somebody wanted to ask comments. I will look this. Okay. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Good morning from Mexico City. Good morning. Good morning. I, I, uh, I didn't understand if, to, if your work is a theoretical proposal or you uh, made some experiments or it was no, not clear it's, for no, me. It's, it's an American it's investigation American. of uh, the of the uh, of the uh, phototransistor device based on doping engineering aspect. What were the variables that you uh, took into account for the for this design uh, about the materials? The materials used for uh, in, in the device. Yes, it's in the photo transistor, photo detector. It's a phototransistor based on a MOSFET platform and a germanium gate. We have removed the gate. And replace and it with germanium. Yes. 
Yes, but what uh, are the characteristics of the device that uh, should be taken into account to, to make this design or, or proposal? I didn't hear you. Can you repeat, please, Mike, your question? Uh, I want to know if you uh, consider some characteristics of the materials for uh, make this uh, phototransistor or only the electronics. The, for the experimental realization of the transistor? The, the characteristics of the materials. Yes, we have used the germanium gate, which can uh, a sensitive gate, which can absorb infrared light. Uh, so uh, the main characteristics of the germanium is its ability for uh, absorbing infrared light due to its low band gap, 0 0.6 electron volt. Uh, also, we have uh, doped uh, the germanium gate with p-type impurities uh, using doping engineering aspect also uh, so we have used the second uh, two regions uh, with different doping levels in the gate uh, also the channel is used uh, <coughs> is suggested with silicium with silicon with silicon silicon uh, channel uh, doped N type, and as a gate oxide, we have used a silicon dioxide material. Thank you. Comments, questions in the audience? We have a couple of minutes more. So, uh, Dr. Haiken, I have a question. So yes. you mentioned yes. uh, about uh, doping engineering. What yes. is the yes. doping profile? That is a Gaussian or complementary error? Which kind of a profile or that is only in basis of a concentration? How you are managing this? Thank you. Thank you for your question. So the gate is suggested with two regions, two different regions. The first one is uniformly doped, which is near the source side. And the, second, and the second one is also uniformly doped and is near the drain side. However, the level of the doping in both regions is different. Only based on a concentration, but that doping is yes. based on a, a thermal diffusion. Which kind of a doping do you use? A unique implementation or 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 uh, thermal diffusion. So in the in the case of germanium, they use uh, commonly use the 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 the, the uh, ionic implementation method for the doping in order to control to better control the doping concentration in the gate. Oh, okay, so ion uh, implementation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments? So, if not, thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> so, we are going to move the next speaker, the same, uh, Dr. Heiken. The title is Numerical Investigation of New uh, Germanium Team MIR Phototransistor based on EXO TFT platform. So please, uh, Dr. Heiken, go ahead. Thank you. Heiken and co-workers is from University of Badna from Algeria. Yes, yes. He's now in Algeria. Yes, I am in Algeria. It's, it's 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, 
I am Dr. Farhati Hisham from University of Batna. So I will provide the main results of my our work entitled Numerical Investigation of a New Germanium Tin Mid-Infrared Phototransistor Based on EGZO Thin Film Platform. So the presentation outlines are given as follows. First, we start with an introduction describing uh, the, <coughs> the use of uh, the recent use of AGZO platform as a new platform for the design of mid infrared phototransistor. Z then we describe the device structure and the modeling methodology. And the fourth section is dedicated to, to uh, present the results and discussion. And finally, we conclude with some remarks and future perspectives. So during the last a few years, transistors have highly <coughs> evaluated. Uh, so uh, several strategies were used to enhance the device, the transistor performances, uh, such as the use of 3-5 materials, germanium, the use of monolayers such as graphene, uh, the use of multiple gate structures, and the insertion of high cam materials to enhance the uh, the channel uh, electrostatic behavior. So optical communication systems is, are divided into three principal stages. The first one is the optical source, the transmitter, and the receiver. Uh, as we know, the use of photodetectors imposes the use of transimpedance amplifiers uh, and uh, several series of amplifiers to uh, achieve the highest logic level that can allow uh, receive the information properly, which can uh, increase the power consumption of the the, the system and also the <coughs> uh, and also the the, the, the cost the the cost of the whole system. So uh, the main objective now is to uh, to get in light of these amplifiers and enhance the optical source uh, characteristics and uh, also uh, reduce the no noise effects. For this purpose, researchers have turned out towards the, the use of uh, phototransistors based on MOSFET platform and also the use of phototransistors based on uh, TFT platform. This technology can, um, can allow getting rid of the power budget, suppressing the wire capacitance, the use of CMOS compatible processing, which is uh, interesting, and the realization of receiverless devices. The objective of this work is to propose a new mid-infrared phototransistor design for optical communication systems. Uh, secondly, the use of Atlas two-dimension numerical simulator uh, to model the proposed device based on germanium tin capping layer. And also the, <coughs> the objective is to evaluate the performance of the proposed phototransistor with, with respect to the conventional ones. And lastly, evaluating the switching capabilities of the proposed device based on EGZO platform. The proposed structure is given in this fugue, phototransistor is given in this fugue. The main, the main idea behind the proposed device resides on combining uh, indium gallium zinc oxide thin film transistor uh, platform and a germanium tin capping layer. The device, the working principle of the device is based on the photogeneration uh, capability of germanium tin in the mid infrared range, which can generate uh, electron hole pairs, uh, which will be transferred to the EGZO uh, channel and then. Uh, and then uh, <coughs> transferred from the source to the drain region 
which can in turn enhance the driver current capability. So in order to model the device performance, we have used numerical methods based on Silvaco software and find difference time domain method. This choice is mainly uh, attributed to the complex behavior of the device where quantum confinement effects in the uh, indium gallium zinc oxide and the amorphous state of the channel uh, can uh, can uh, make the analytical modeling interpretable in order to assess the performance of the device we can see from we can uh, see from this figure which describes the uh, drain current as a function of the gate voltage for uh, under dark and infrared illumination conditions. It can be seen, seen from this figure that the proposed infrared phototransistor shows the high photoresponse characteristics in the negative voltages as compared to the conventional one, which cannot respond in the infrared region. So it can be seen also from this figure that the use of higher tin, tin uh, mole fraction can allow a absorption capabilities of the device when uh, a high mole fraction, high tin mole fraction is used. It can be seen also that the threshold voltage shift under illumination is occurred, which enables enhancing the photocurrent in a large operating voltage window. To Analyze the effect of the tin mole fraction on the sensing capabilities of the device. Uh, this figure shows both current ratio and responsivity as a function of the tin mole fraction. It can be seen from this figure that the device responsivity and the current ratio increases with the <coughs> SN mole fraction increase until ach achieving the highest value for a uh, tin mole fraction of 15%. So this is because of the high absorption capabilities of germanium tin with high mole fraction. To investigate the performance of uh, the device for optical switching applications, so the device is implemented in an optical inverter gate circuit and the output voltage as a function of the optical signal for both conventional germanium gate MOSFET and the proposed device based on germanium tin and indium gallium zinc oxide thin transistor platform are given in this figure. It can be seen from this figure that, that, that the proposed device shows better switching capabilities and reduced noise effect as compared to the conventional device based on MOSFET platform. This improvement is attributed to the role of combining thin film transistor platform and a highly sensitive germanium thin film in promoting enhanced photoresponse and reduced dark noise effects. So for the concluding remarks, so a new infrared phototransistor based on combined indium gallium zinc oxide TFT platform with germanium tin capping layer is proposed and numerically investigated. Atlas two-dimensional simulator is used to accurately model the photoelectrical behavior of the proposed device. Then a circuit level investigation is carried out to analyze the switching capabilities of the proposed device. It is found that the proposed device can, <coughs> can offer 
a high photoresponse characteristics with low dark noise effects, which makes it highly suitable for the emerging optical communication systems. For the future works, the present work can be extended by uh, introducing plasmonic effects using metallic nanoparticles, such as gold nanoparticles, to further enhance the device infrared photoresponse. Uh, capping the device with uh, efficient sensitive layers can be used also to extend the sensing range to the visible band. Uh, besides, metaoristic techniques can be implemented to further boost the device performances for optical wireless communication applications. So thank you for your attention. Paper is open for discussion. Any question from the audience? We have enough time. So if not, I have a, a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, regarding uh, uh, TFT, uh, you have a photo detector, but also the normal or conventional structure of a, a transist transistor, this uh, MOS. So you, you, you are going to operate in both uh, with a photo response, and, but also with a conventional uh, a mode. Uh, what is the approach? Uh, how you are doing uh, these two uh, dual uh, how to say, uh, function in this device that is normally used in this way for a photo detection, yes. but also yes. conventional? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the conventional thin film transistor is based on indium gallium zinc oxide channel with source, gate, source and drain and gate uh, electrodes. So this the, this, the, this is the conventional TFT transistor, TFT, thin frame transistor. The properties of this device can, uh, are based on its low dark current as compared to the conventional MOSFET one. So this kind of the device uh, of the devices are used for low power consumption. Uh, uh, electronic circuits. So uh, the idea is to introduce a new sensitive layer on the indium gallium zinc oxide, which is the germanium tin uh, film. The germanium tin film uh, <coughs> contributes to the infrared photoresponse. So photogenerated, when the device is illuminated, uh, photogenerated kaya will be induced in the germanium tin layer and then transferred to the channel, to the indium gallium zinc oxide channel, back channel, which can shift the threshold voltage of the transistor. And when the threshold voltage of the transistor is shifted, a high photoresponse characteristics can be achieved. In that sense, the operation of this kind of a device uh, should be uh, coordinated with a photo uh, detection system together with a conventional gate. That's right? Yes. It's a missing combination. It's a combination between a photo detector and the transistor. Any other question? from the audience. Uh, okay, we, we have also uh, enough time. I have another question. So the, yes. you, you are doping a uh, team uh, uh, for a germanium. What is the role of a team? Uh, you are reducing the band gap. How yes. you are changing the properties? Could you tell us? Yes. Thank you for your question, Mr. So the use of a germanium tin uh, capping layer is mainly due to its low band gap in order to achieve a high, uh, a high photoresponse in the mid infrared range. It's not possible by using the only germanium gate. 
because of the cutoff wavelength of the germanium is nearly 1.55 micrometers. So to extend the sensing properties of the device to the mid infrared range, we have to explore new materials such as the germanium tin, which can offer low band gap and also a high photoresponse over the mid infrared range, which is the main communication band in the optical communication systems used for the optical communication systems. So the use of high mold fraction tin can reduce the band gap and also increase the absorption capabilities of the germanium in the uh, over over the the, the mid infrared range. So the main reason behind using high tin mold fraction is to enhance the photoresponse in the mid infrared mid infrared range. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mister. Any other? from the audience. No, it's no. So thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Dr. Heiken. <laughs> we have uh, two or three minutes for our next <laughs> speaker, but uh, probably we can start uh, preparing. Uh, the next title is Electrostatic Model for Semiconductor Radial Nanowire Heterojunctions. This is given from Christian Hoven Rodriguez and co workers. Uh, so, uh, Christian, if you are ready, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes. Uh, okay. Probably we can, we can wait uh, one minute. Okay, no problem. Hello, Christian Oven Rodriguez, please, you can start. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, so, uh, good morning for everybody. My name is Christian David Hoven Rodriguez. I'm a master student from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you our work named Electrostatic Model for Semiconductor Radial Nanowire Heterojunctions. Uh, this work was developed by the Dr. Arturo Morales Acevedo from the Simbestab and the Dr. Roberto Bernal Correa from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia, sede Orinoquia. So, uh, we have an overview. Uh, first, we have a brief introduction. Second, device details. Third, uh, model details. Fourth, some results. And five, some conclusions. First, an introduction. Uh, in this work, we report a semi-analytical electrostatic model for the radial nanowire cells formed by core shell heterojunctions. 
Furthermore, in order to show the application of the model examples for both heterojunctions and homojunctions, radial nanowire solar cells, silicon, over induced phosphide, and induced phosphide are shown. Finally, we conclude that calculation based on this kind of model is a very important step to predict the performance of radial heterojunctions device, considered a promising alternative for developing solar cells. The device details, uh, we assume a configuration co consists of two semiconductors, uh, the core and the shell, where R1 is the core radius and R2 is the, the, is the total radius of the device. L is the length of the nanowire. PN heterojunctions schematics. Uh, in the figure two, uh, we see the schematics of the PN radial nanowire heterojunctions dimensions when we have a core, uh, a P-type core semiconductor limited by R1 and a N-type shell semiconductor limited by R2 less R1. Uh, the spatial region thickness is a uh, omega P uh, for the uh, spatial region thickness in the P material and omega N for the spatial region thickness in the end material. Model details. Uh, for, the, for these details, uh, Poisson's equations for the potential phi must be solved in a similar manner to a planar heterojunction, uh, where epsilon is the dielectric constant of the material and rho is the charge density. Simplifying the Laplacian operator in cylindrical coordinates, the following equation in radial terms can be obtained. The equation number two. The general solutions for the electric field and the potential fee uh, are below. We get the equation number three and number four, uh, where C1 and C2 are the integration constants that can be found by applying the appropriate boundary conditions. It's important uh, the build in potential for the homojunctions and heterojunctions. Uh, in this slide, in the left side, uh, we can see the built in the expression for the built in potential in a PN homojunction. Uh, that is the equation number five, is, is in terms of the acceptor density, donor density, and in, uh, intrinsic, dens uh, intrinsic carrier density. In the right side, uh, we can see the built-in potential and the band diagram for uh, heterojunctions. Uh, the, six, the expression number six uh, is the built-in potential that is in terms of the acceptor density, uh, donor density, uh, electron affinities, uh, band gap of two semiconductors, and the density of states in the valence and conduction band. For our device, the PN heterojunctions, the boundary conditions for the integration constants C1 and C2, uh, we, we get that constant when we analyze the more inner zone in the nanowire where the electric field and the electric potential is equal to zero and the more external zone uh, of the semiconductor where the uh, electric field is equal to zero, but uh, the, the potential is equal to the built-in potential. Uh, when we uh, consider the volumetric charge density, uh, that is the fundamental charge uh, per uh, acceptor density in the P side of the semiconductor and the fundamental charge per uh, donor density, in the end semiconductor, we get the electric field and the electric potential function for all the device. This is uh, the electric field and the potential are piecewise functions uh, for the four zones in the device. And after that, uh, we consider the limit between the two materials, the electric displacement uh, needs to be continued and the electric potential needs to be continued too. So uh, we get the expression number uh, 13 and 14 
when we cons consider it, this, uh, this continuity, the electric displacement and the electric potential, and working in these two expressions, we can get the following transcendental equations for omega p and omega n, that is the space shard region thickness uh, in the p semiconductor and n semiconductor. The uh, expression number 15 and 16, uh, these two expressions can be solved using a numerical method. In this case, uh, we use the newton raphson method. For results, uh, for the results, a Python program was developed using the newton raphson method to solve the transcendental equations. The electric field and the potential distribution were calculated uh, the calculations were made for both radial nanowire heterojunctions, silicon indium phosphide, and homojunction indium phosphide. The calculations were made for the variation of R1, and all calculations were made for the symmetric case, where uh, acceptor density is equal to donor density. Constants and parameters. Uh, for the example simulation, the core and the shell radius were set to 50 nanometers and 100 nanometers, respectively, for both, for both uh, heterojunctions and homojunction case. The constants shown in tables 1 and 2 were used and reported in the literature. Uh, in the table 1 and 2, we get the effective density of states in the conductions and in the balance band for both materials, uh, indium phosphide and silicon, the donor density, acceptor density, and the gap, electron affinity, and the dielectric constant for both materials used in the simulation. For the silicon indium phosphide heterojunction, uh, silicon is assumed to be the core material since it's experimentally easier to manufacture the nanowire device when indium phosphide is grown over the silicon. The band diagram is in the figure number five, where, where you can uh, we can see the built-in potential that is equal to 1.403 volts. With this boil potential, uh, we can get the spatial radio thickness, uh, omega p and omega n. Uh, the figure number six shows the results. The vertical dotted line corresponds to the forward critical voltage uh, that is equal to 1.226 volts, below which the core is completely depleted. With the space shard region thickness, uh, we can get the, the electric field and the electric potential distributions. Uh, as we can see in, the, in this slide, in the left side, uh, we get the electric field in radial terms for the PN heterojunctions for three, three apiolated voltage. In this case, 1.4, 1.33, and 1.226 volts. It's important, uh, it's important say that the electric field is not continued in the limit between the two materials. Uh, this fact is due to the difference between the, the electric constant of the semiconductors P and N. And the figure 7B uh, shows a top view of the electric field in the PN heterojunction for the applied voltage equal to 1.226 volts. For the electric potential uh, in the figure number eight, we get a potential distribution uh, that is the built-in potential less the applied forward voltage. Uh, for this case, like in the electric field, we, we take the applied voltage equal to the critical voltage for uh, the top view of the potential in this device. Heterojunctions core radius variation effect. Uh, the total nanowire diameter is constant to 100 nanometers. The critical voltage change when we take uh, R1 equal to 25 nanometers, R1 equal to 50 nanometers, 
and the behavior of the critical voltage is that this increased as the core radius is smaller for these two cases. Uh, on the other hand, when R1 is equal to the 75 nanometer, nanometers, uh, the shell becomes fully depleted when, when this is the radius inner. For the indium phosphide homojunctions, uh, in the left side, uh, we can see the band diagram when the uh, built-in potential is equal to 1.177 volts, uh, as in the like in the heterojunctions case, uh, we get that the spatial regions thickness can be get by uh, using this built-in potential. So. In the right side, uh, we have the spatial thickness omega p and omega p for the symmetric indium phosphide homojunction. Like in the heterojunction case, uh, we show in this slide the electric field and the electric potential. Uh, it's important to say that in this case, the electric field is continue between the two materials. Uh, this fact is because the, the electric constant is equal uh, for the homojunction. So uh, we, we select for the B figure, the applied voltage equal to the critical voltage, 0 0.887 volts. And, and we get the magnitude of the electric field in the indium phosphide homojunction in radial terms of the device. For the electric potential, uh, we get two a uh, distribution of the built-in potential less the applied voltage and the top view of the magnitude of the potential uh, in radial terms of the device. Some conclusions. A complete electrostatic semi-analytical model for radial nanowire heterojunctions was developed for PN core shell semiconductor disposition, which can also be used for nanowire homojunctions device. The spatial region extensions in its size can be calculated from the transcendental equations obtained from the solution of the Poisson equation in cylindrical coordinates. In addition, it's possible to determine the electrical field and the potential distribution within the nanowire device so that further calculations will be possible for determining the current density versus voltage curve of a nanowire solar cell. To illustrate the application of the developed expressions, we have shown some examples of hem heterojunctions and homojunctions device. This is the first step to simulate and design high efficiently solar cells based on radial nanowire heterojunctions in the future. Thanks for your attention. Comments, questions from the audience. Okay, for my look. Thank you for your presentation. Mm. Can you explain us how? <laughs> How we can imagine in the practice the solar cell? The, uh, I don't know if it is a surface covered by these uh, core shells, these columns, or how how would be the, it would be this solar cell system, or the solar cell individually? Okay, thanks okay. for the question. For uh, so, we can add this device, the nanowires, to the solar cell. Uh, let me. Uh, we can add this device to the solar cell when we consider it the fact that the uh, the light, uh, the absorption of the photo, uh, the carriers, the photons in the 
vertical axis, but the uh, trans the carrier transport is in the radial in the radial direct direction. So um, we can't use this device uh, for uh, trap the photons and for the carrier transport in radial in radial dimension. So uh, when we consider it, this fact uh, is easier to collect the carriers in the device because the dimensions of the radius is are smaller than in a planar conventional solar cell. Uh, mini solar cells are covering the surface. Yes, this this device can be in the surface of the of a uh, other other um, other materials in a solar cell. Thank you. Okay, I have a uh, one question, uh, Christian. That is probably in the same uh, direction as uh, uh, Maria de Luz said. Uh, regarding this figure, uh, what is the uh, illumination uh, can get uh, this uh, core shear? Is from the uh, surface of the shear, or which part is entering the light or the, the sun? Uh, okay, the, the light. Uh is present in this in this kind of uh, of device uh, in the vertical axis. So uh, the photon uh, come from uh, the vertical axis, and the carrier transport is in the radial axis. So uh, this device can be in the surface of of other materials that can be uh, uh, can be the the body of the cell. But uh, this device can be in the in the surface uh, when the light, the sunlight, is trapped in the vertical axis and uh, the transport of the carriers uh, in the radial axis. Uh, Victor Cabrera, please. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I, yes, I hear yes. you. Okay. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. It's uh, a topic, uh, a really interesting topic. And I was wondering when, when it is considered to be analytical or semi-analytic uh, solution, some approximation are assumed. Under what condition are this approximation valid? Can you tell us something about this? Okay, uh, this appro approximation is valid uh, when you use only two semiconductors, only one uh, P, P material in the core and N semiconductor in the in the shell. So is is valid this consideration uh, when you use uh, in this case when you use uh, the the constant and the parameters realistic for the materials. So uh, in this case, we use uh, uh, silicon constants and indium phosphide constants used in the practice and experimental and in simulations. In some simulations, uh, in the in the investigation of the semiconductors and in other solar cells, uh, planar solar cells. Okay, so. This model can be realistic. Forget the in this moment. Forget the electric potential and the electric field when you use only two uh, two surface to two volumetric uh, volumetric semiconductors uh, in a nanowire disposition like this. But when you use a realistic constant for the two semiconductors, it can be uh, indium phosphide, silicon, uh, and uh, anyone, any any semi semiconductor. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. Okay. Because of time, so thank you very much, Christian Rodriguez.
let's move to the next speaker. Uh, the title is Class AV Differential Amplifier Implemented as an Impedance Guide Writer and its Applications. Uh, this is given by Eduardo Gonzalez and Ivan Padilla from Universidad de Guadalajara. Is there Eduardo Gonzalez? Yes. Start, and Eduardo. <coughs> Yes, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Eduardo Gonzalez. I'm from Universidad de Guadalajara. I will present in a paper, uh, Class IB Differential Amplifier Implemented as an Impedance Generator and its Applications. Uh, introduction. Uh, in the electronics industry, it's necessary to use uh, passive components integrated in a chip. Uh, this implies various deficiencies. Uh, meet the most important is a large area required by these components. Among the passive components, the inductor is the one that uh, needs the largest silicon area. If a larger area of silicon is used, it represents a higher monetary cost uh, due to the increasing need to integrate components uh, on a single silicon die. A practical alternative is to use uh, active inductors, uh, which have a certain uh, important characteristics. Okay, uh, the circuit needs a small area in comparison with the passive inductor. Uh, the bandwidth is wide enough for the required application. In this case of this work, we have approximately uh, four decades of operation uh, with the 180 nanometers technology. It has a low voltage. Uh, operation, which is ideal for current application and trends in ship design. In this case, uh, it works quite 1.1 volts. The tunability uh, is a main advantage in the impedance generator, uh, as there are very simple ways to change the operate, operating range of impedance. Uh, this is possible by changing the value of the transconductance in the operational transconductance amplifier or changing the value of the capacitor. Uh, the high accuracy is based on devices that can be physical matched using proper layout techniques. Okay, uh, this is a this is a conventional circuit uh, found in the reference for. Uh, it's used as a basis for making a proposal. The advantage of using a OTA is the controllability of the transconductance. It's simple to modify this parameter, which uh, directly helps to change the volume of the equivalent inductance. Uh, to find the equivalent impedance, uh, it's necessary to obtain the voltage at this point and the current number two. Firstly, to get the current number one uh, is equal to transconductance of this OTA uh, times the voltage in this point minus the voltage in this point. So it's equal to GM1 uh, times VO. Uh, this current generates a voltage in the capacitor. Uh, it's equal to current uh, number one times the impedance uh, of the capacitor. So it's equal to current one divided by AC. Uh, so uh, replacing the current one is equal to BO uh, ti times GM1 uh, divided by AC. The current number two is equal to transconductance in this OTA uh, times the voltage in this point minus the voltage in this point that is the voltage in the capacitor. So the current uh, number two 
uh, is equal to minus uh, transconductance one uh, times transconductance two uh, times volt uh, PO divided by AC. So the equivalent impedance uh, is PO divided by current two. Uh, replacing the current two, uh, we get uh, this equation. Uh, finally, we have the equivalent impedance, uh, the capacitor divided by the transconductance of the OTA1 uh, times OTA2. Well, uh, this implementation is simple, uh, but we have a limitation. Uh, first of all, uh, we can only use the connected uh, to ground in this form. So it's limited uh, to make applications. Uh, another limitation is that if I connect a heavy load, uh, the OTA uh, will not be able to maintain the current. The solution is to change the implementation to this form. Uh, we get uh, three OTAs and equivalent impedance as a floating inductor. If we perform the same analysis again, we obtain the same uh, equivalent impedance. Okay, uh, for more practical purpose, uh, I changed the three simple OTAs for two fully differential OTAs. Uh, it has the same bay and doesn't need the connection to GND. This is a representation of the proposed circuit. Okay, uh, once the circuit is represented, it's only necessary to add uh, some characteristics uh, so that the impedance of generator is of a class AB uh, so that it's capable uh, of supporting heavy loads and maintaining uh, its linearly. Uh, the local common mode feedback uh, is a critical part of the circuit uh, the RF resistors are large and allow the excursion voltage to exist and the nodes A and B, uh, allowing transistor uh, 12 and A uh, and it turns uh, 6 and 16 uh, to guide uh, bidirectional currents of the output. Uh, the transistors 9, 9, 10, uh, 13, and 14 uh, are cascade uh, arrangement. Uh, this increases the output resistance and the operational range of the generator uh, without affecting the ability to uh, provide large um, output currents. Uh, this circuit is an equivalent uh, to a floated inductor. The impedance generator was implemented in layout. Uh, the lie, generator only occupies, in this case, uh, the 28% of the area, uh, which is uh, 3,096 uh, square area micrometers. Uh, the interdigitation and common mode uh, common centroid techniques were implemented in order to have a better matching between the transistors and thus obtain a better behavior. Okay, uh, the circuit was implemented uh, in an 180 nanometers technology. Uh, the image shows the an important advantage of the impedance generator, the tunability. Uh, we can adjust the uh, oper operating frequency range if we change the value of the capacitor. Uh, the image shows a different values of the capacitance uh, that can affect the inductance of the circuit. Uh, one of the most used application is filters. Uh, in this case, it's tested in a tier order Buddha world uh, filter. Uh, this circuit is connected in this way. 
the simulation is done in Spectre. Uh, I has a fairly good level of the notion of minus um, 160 decibels. Uh, this is an, a transfer function of the filter, uh, which is used to compare the simulation to its mathematical forms. Okay, uh, the image is about diagram of the transfer function. In this way, correct operation of the filter is ensured when use an active inductor. Uh, the table uh, shows two parameters, the ideal filter gain, and in mathematical form is zero decibels, uh, while the simulation is uh, minus uh, 850 millidecibels. The cutoff frequency is uh, 9.21 kilohertz and 7.72 kilohertz. Both parameters are quite close. And this is a comparative table um, with other words showing uh, most important parameters technology. Uh, inductive uh, bandwidth, uh, inductance, and power. Uh, the technologies are 19, 100 theory, and 100 theory uh, nanometers, uh, respectively. Uh, the words are in the megahertz range. Uh, in this work, from uh, 1.72 kilohertz to 1 megahertz, using a uh, 10 picofarad uh, capacitor. Uh, the inductance is twice that of the circuit 5, and it has a power dissipation efficiency of 90%. Okay, conclusions. An efficient active inductor was development uh, that only needs a 17 transistor uh, for its operation. Uh, works on a uh, low voltage environments. However, thanks uh, to its AB class, it can withstand a uh, heavy loads if, if uh, required. It, it was provided that it can be used in various implementation. In this case, a tier order uh, motherboard file there. And one way the insurance current behavior was to implement its uh, transfer function uh, in MATLAB. Uh, okay, uh, this is our data reference usage. Thank you for the attention. Questions? For discussion, any question? Um, I have a question. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Just, just checking. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Oh, I have a question. Uh, uh, can you give us um, other applications you might use your circuit in besides filters? Uh, I mean, again. Can you use, <clears throat> sorry, can you use your circuit in other apl applications besides uh, filters? Okay, uh, the circuit is uh, versatile. Uh, sorry. Uh, obviously, I can use the circuit in other filters and this circuit, uh, we can, uh, realize modifications. Uh, in this part, uh, we can obtain a, mm, a comportament uh, different in this part. If I, I use uh, other passive components and modify the, uh, the, applica um, the comportament of the circuit, uh, the Circuit is class AB, uh, so as uh, has the benefit a uh, uh, good linearly and heavy load support. Uh, so the uh, applications are 
are <laughs> some much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, we have uh, a couple of minutes. So I have also one question uh, regarding application nowadays technology. Uh, okay, you mentioned about the uh, uh, frequency you can uh, get, but regarding uh, power, uh, what is the power you can consider with this kind of uh, technology? Uh, it is possible to apply for uh, uh, kind of uh, power uh, electronics, or that is some limitation. Um, obviously, the limitation and the technology limits the um, the power dissipation. But uh, in this case, uh, we can uh, obtain a. A uh, big power, uh, but uh, the transistor uh, needs to to be a and to be in unsatur saturation. Uh, so in this form, uh, the voltage is very low, uh, e and I have a. I have a okay in this case and this technology in this work uh, we have a better efficiency of power that other works and this is uh, approximately uh, eighty eight. Uh, 0 0.088 uh, milliwatts in comparison with others that is uh, 10, 10 times. Uh, so. Okay, thank you. And regarding the dimension, you mentioned we have a capacitor. So the capacitor, it is difficult to uh, have a with a low dimension Th that is li limited the dimension by capacitor in this case the dimension okay the dimension is uh, 90 Ninety six micrometers uh, times 86 uh, micrometers is okay but the capacitor, how 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 bigger is the cap? Uh, yes. Uh, that is including the capacitance or not? No, in this case only the impedance curator and is the this size and this is our area of the chip. Do you have the capacitor? capacitor? No. Size of her capacitor. Do you have or not? No, no. In no. this case, in this um, this area, no. Uh, but and the capacitor is variable uh, depending of the application. In this case, is ten picofarads, and the only impedance generator is it this this sizes. Uh, the capacitor is eighty six micrometers by nine ninety six micrometers. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. So if not, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. So we yeah, want to move to the last uh, presenter. Fabrication of pure thin oxide pellets at different uh, near temperature for CO and uh, propane gas sensors. Uh, that is from Goban. Kumar, Banner, Servan, and co workers uh, from uh, Simvesta. So, please go on. Hi, uh, my topic is based on uh, uh, semiconductor metal oxide gas sensors, and my title is Fabrication of Pure Thin Oxide Pellet at Different 
आणि टेम्परेचर फॉर सीओ अनप्रोपेन गॅस सेन्सर Today I'm doing, I'm going to cover uh, the outline of the objective, introduction, methodology, results and discussion and conclusion. So an objective, the main objective is I have to fabricate a thin offset gas sensor pellet for a different analytic temperature and characterize the structural, morphological and optical properties and study and analyze and sensing analysis of two gases. And why I choose the two gases? Uh, because I'm just going to explain. Before we go into the topic, we have to know why this is very important. and where it is useful and where it is applied in day to day life sorry uh, in day to day life we are using uh, lots of products uh, are manufactured and produced from the industries uh, these industries are uh, produce a uh, lots of uh, emissions and these emission causes lots of uh, toxic gases and uh, these toxic gas leads to lots of problem and uh, these are the main so, uh, these are the secondary source okay these are the secondary source of uh, uh, gas leakage in the world uh, second leakage in the world and uh, these are the second uh, secondary source of gas leakage the industries and uh, you can see the other other two the toxic gas in atmosphere and toxic gas in homes uh, we use a uh, lots of a uh, combustion uh, fuels one of the transport use the combustion fuels and burns and releases lots of a uh, co no2 and h2s and lots of gases these gases are also very harmful and these are the primary source and in household equipment also we are using a uh, uh, burning the things for cooking uh, food or uh, other purposes uh, for the daily usages these also releases this is also a primary source of the gas and because of these all it causes a lots of a harmful for example here we can see the dizziness and the skin irritation and the eye irritation and respiratory diseases and in an every year in a, each country there are a, a death of more than a 400 people uh 400 people so it, got, it 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 should be a very important to have a detector in every place and you see that the world is fully polluted the world is fully polluted with the uh, air pollution it's because of that uh, the urban areas is fully poli- uh, fully populated and the, every people are mostly having uh, the automobiles and lots of stuff in the industries so it's getting uh, more polluted and it causes the more emission and lots of uh, diseases and these are the diseases usually happens and uh, percentage the heart stroke and heart disease and chronic pulmonary disease and lung cancer and the, and the lower respiratory infection in children this there are many gases here uh, or toxic gases but i choose the two gases the carbon monoxide and propane is because the co- there are these are the two gases usually le- get leaks in a day to day life where h2s and no2 it leaks depends upon the industries so the propane and the co is a primary source of leakage so that's why i'm going for the two gases why co the co can be seen of course and it can be smell and can be hear and it can be stopped by pro- by keeping our detectors or monitors in everywhere the sensor so it, in that's the way we can stop the co these are the ways how the co is produced the burning of wood oil and charcoal especially homes the main reason for the production of co in the atmosphere which is ultimately used causes of global warming the table which explains the ppm and the time and symptoms where the the 50 ppm it causes a permissible it's like it's okay Uh, when you expose with that gas, but if you go for the 200, it causes a headache, discomfort, possibility of collapse in the 120 more than a 120 minutes, and more than 1000 to 2000 ppm, it causes headaches and the confusion and palpitation and nausea, and more than in the 2000 to 3000 range, it causes unconsciousness, and above 3000 may cause fatal or fatal or death. It may be a life threat or problem. That's why the CO is more important. Why? while the propane is uh, not a toxic but it's a extremely flammable gas and odorless gas but propane is stored in the every house we use in a daily purpose if it is stored safely it's not a big issue but in the case of the gas leakage the propane will get into the air and it get uh, flammable with a spark or any other fire it causes a lots of uh, fire pollution it may cause us death in another way the when people or animal come in contact with the propane it's usually in a gaseous state making inhalation the most common form of exposure because it replaces the oxygen in your lungs the symptoms of propane, propane inhalation related to the oxygen deprivation 
The mean propane will displace the oxygen in lungs, making it difficult or impossible to breathe if exposed to high concentration. So it's very important to go for the propane. And these are the symptoms of propane inhalation, the low exposure, nausea, dizziness, headaches, drowsiness, coughing, irregular heartbeat, pain, or numbers and limbs, and convulsion, diarrhea, and rapid loss of constitution, and uh, heart failure. These are the symptoms which when you're exposed to the propane. propane. So these are the important things why I'm going for the propane and the CO. Sensors. Sense, the basically sensors we use in every place or uh, even in uh, every industries, but most of the sensor, it's not it's not like a life threat, but for the gas, we need a se gas sensor, which is life threatening. We, uh, it's like a saving the life of the human beings and even the animals and, the, and many purposes. Sensor is a device that receives a signal and responds with the electric signal. And it's analytic. You it's see the, the diagram of the, of the block diagram, it's analytic. When you are analytic, get into the transducer, it converts into electronic and gives output. When uh, something which gets a uh, uh, reactor with uh, sense, the sensing material, it just uh, do uh, some kind of a chemical reaction or a thermal reaction or any kind of reaction and gives us electronic data and it can be measured, it can be taken in output so that we can measure uh, how much, uh, uh, what are the problems and what are the measurements we can do and we can further go for it. Without sensor, we can't uh, improve it. So sensor is very important. There are types of sensors. The types of sensors is classified based on the working principle the IR sensor, metal semiconductor sensor, fluorescent sensor, electrochemical sensor. The, these all sensor works on a different basis, but I choose the metal semiconductor sensor. Uh, it's a change of electrical resistance of before and after absorption of target gas molecule. When compared to the other, sen other uh, type of sensor, um, metal oxide sensor is more, more efficient and uh, it's very cheap and uh, it's convenient to work with it. The semiconductor metal oxide uh, based metal oxide sensor have been more successfully developed at research, uh, laboratory and industry level. Why I go for SM, why I go for the semiconductor metal oxide gas sensor is very attractive, uh, easy for fabrication and low cost and low detection limit and simple operation principle. It has a various parameters considering types of sensors such as selectivity, sensitivity, stability, repeatability response, and recovery times of sensor. The lifetime of the metal oxide semiconductor gas sensor is long and quite resistant. It's not get poisoned or toxic. The performance of sensor in terms of sensing response and response time and recovery time. These are the three important parameters which are very important for the SMO sensors. The nano size materials can efficiently increase the surface area and surface area to the volume ratio for the catalytic reaction which increases the catalytic activity for the oxidation to take place. The particle size decreases, the surface volume ratio of the nanostructure increases. It leads to lots of remarkable properties like the quantum coefficient. The semiconductor, uh, metal oxide semiconductor has a two process. One is a receptor and transducer. The receptor which just interacts with the gas molecules and transducer which does a chemical reaction and we get an output. These are the two steps. And uh, the gas sensing properties are the easy to miniaturize. It can be go for the more nanoparticle size, uh, more than less than 10 nanometers, and draft and reliable. It can be designed to operate all range of condition, including high temperatures. Where uh, in other uh, materials, in the, after more than a 400 or 600 temperature, it, it may not be uh, variable, and it can be produced in arrays to alloy of multiple species simultaneously. Detection limits are approaching in uh, PPM. These are the literature survey. If you see the parameters, these are the parameters, as I said before, it's very important. And you see that the metal oxide semiconductor and optical gas sensor and catalytic gas sensor and thermoconductor sensor. If you see in everything, it just metal oxide semiconductor show a, a good uh, results like excellent and uh, good and fair. But another thing, it shows on most of them, most of the time it's poor and fair. So in that case, I'm just going for the metal oxide a gas sensor. The metal oxide gas sensor have a different uh, uh, metal, uh, different materials like a thin oxide, zinc oxide, titanium oxide, and other uh, n-type material. But I'm going for the thin oxide due to their properties of polycrystalline white band, semi, white band cap semiconductor, and it does not melt up to 2,100 degrees Celsius, which, ha which doesn't have other met metal oxide semiconductor. 
it is a it has a group of 14 element with oxidation of plus 2 and plus 4 and tin oxide is a promising and appropriate choice for implementation in gas sensor due to the high sensitivity suitable chemical stability and low cost it is a n type semiconductor and operates at a working temperature of 200 to 500 degrees celsius and tin oxide is basically rutile and uh, rutile structure and it is a tetragonal unit and it is a single unit atom cell where the oxygen is uh, where the tin is surrounded with the six atom of oxygen and it has a good band gap of 3.6 electron volt it fits in the surface sensitive material though it's a bulk properties uh, generally sensor used for gas detection or prepared for thick porous tin oxide samples with the higher surface to volume ratio when the material is heated the electron trapped by absorbing as well as the band breaking causes change in conductivity it has a good property for the tin oxide the literature survey shows that um, in all all the metal oxide semiconductors the tin oxide has a more successful gas sensors and uh, it has a moderate temperature and due chemical stability fast response large exciting binding energy and high selectivity and cost these are the literature survey has done and gas and gas sensing mechanism of metal oxide semiconductor uh, the basically if you see uh, when uh, when you uh, when you keep when you keep a material in the atmosphere while uh, the uh, the oxygen just react with the material it just uh, uh, absorb on the material surface absorb on the material surface and just extract the electron from the material so there will be a, a space charge layer will be formed and the, that space charge layer is called as a Schottky barrier and it it because of the Schottky barrier there will be a uh, resistance will get resistance will get increased because of the resistance get increased the, there will be no free of electrons in the uh, material so the conductivity will be very low so this graph shows that resistance decreases decreases if you see in the same case as the target gas which interacts with the material it just uh, desorption will take place where the, the electron will get extracted in the material and uh, when it's when extract uh, when, when injected into the material when injects into the material where the electron flow will be happening the space charge layer will be getting decreased and because of the decrease there will be no sturdy barrier there will be a resistance more decrease and increases in the conductivity and there will be flow of electron with this flow of electron we can measure the sensitivity of the gas sensing material and if you see for the example here you can see that the uh, sno2 gas sensor which react with the co and with the atmosphere in the air where the oxygen get absorbed on the surface and it just uh, in, uh, uh, extract the electron so the, the so the the like uh, the the boundaries the grain boundaries have become a uh, in larger space so the grain boundary will get increased which is called a space charge will be more increased there will be a no flow of electron while when you are in when, when you when you are exposed to the carbon monoxide gas the electron will get injected inside so there will be a space charge will get reduced and easy to flow of electrons where the grain boundary will get decreased so we have a good flow of electrons with this we can uh, measure the gas sensing and this is the mechanism of the metallic uh, metal oxide semiconductor gas sensor uh, methodology uh, synthesis of tin oxide nanoparticle usually in the most of the literature papers the, the tin oxide is synthesized by using the tin chloride tin chloride but uh, they never have a tried with the other material and tin chloride is like a toxic and even it's uh, contag contagious and it's very maybe it's harmful in the future maybe it won't be a uh, good effectivable so i try to do a synthesis with the uh, uh, tin acetate so i'm just taking the 4. Point gram of sodium hydroxide and mixed with the 300 ml of solution 300 ml of methanol and make as a solution a and 1.8 gram of tin acetate and maybe with the 180 ml of water and made a solution B and I'm just making a thin acetate solution in a burette I'm just uh, keeping in a drop by drop into the sodium hydroxide solution parallelly I'm just heating the solution for 30 minutes at a 60 degrees Celsius after that I'm continuing to heat the solution for 90, 90, 90 minutes at six, same 60 degrees Celsius then later we can get uh, we form the white precipitate will be formed these white precipitate will be formed uh, the waste precipitate will be collected and washed four times using a methanol by using a centrifuge sample for the, at the rate of 5000 rpm for seven minutes 
Then after that, they collect the sample and calcinate the sample at 200 degrees Celsius for an hour. And just dividing this sample for three, dividing the sample at three and make and uh, first of all the white samples are collected and these samples are making it divided to three and each sample I'm just making annealing into 600 and 700 or 800 degrees Celsius. So I'm getting a for a two hours 600 some degrees Celsius and I'm just annealed. So I'm getting the three samples with the three different temperatures. Finally, I get the powder and by using the powder tin oxide uh, with a different uh, annealing temperature with this optimizing this optimizing pressing condition. I'm using a pellet with a first step. I'm just making a 2.5 ton for the one minute and five tons for the uh, fifth minute and third step 7.5 ton for the one minute and finally 10 tons for the 14 minute and then I'm just getting ready with the pellets for making a gas sensing uh, material. And these are the in the table. These are the parameters I use for the making the pellets. Um, two, two minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. Two, two so, presentation. Uh, the results and discussion actually. If you see, uh, these are the actually peaks for the 600 and 700 degrees annealing temperature, where the 600 have a very uh, less uh, intensity. While we are increasing the annealing temperature, you can see that uh, the stronger intensity, stronger intensity will be formed, and you can see that 110, 101, and 211 is a main plane for the tin oxide. And even if it is a match with the JCT case, the number 00071147, and the crystalline size is calculated using the Debussier equation. Equation. And uh, in the this is a graph for the crystalline size increases when increasing the temperature. And I use the three important peaks, the 110, 101, 211 thing. And I just took the full width half maximum and just calculate the crystalline size using the Debussier equation. And you can see clearly explained that a 600 degrees Celsius is less crystalline, while a 700, 800 degrees Celsius shows a high crystalline sample. From this uh, XRD, we can understand that. The same analysis, it is a 600 degrees Celsius and 700 degrees Celsius, 800 degrees Celsius with a different magnification. It's 2000 and 5000 and 50,000. Uh, magnification. You can see that in 600 degrees Celsius, it's a slurry like structure and agglomerated. It's getting migrated and uh, uh, it, it forms a uh, irregular shape and there is a no shape. While you see in the 700 degrees Celsius, in the more annealing temperature, it shows a random, like regular and irregular shape with little agglomeration and little uh, uh, migration. While in the, you see in the 800 degrees Celsius, it, is a, it forms a regular shape where it is a spherical in shape and uh, Still, we can see the agglomeration and migration, but it's when compared to the above sample, it is very less. And the party average particle size is increased uh, with annealing temperature 35, 60, 85 nanometer for 600 and 700 degrees Celsius. And, uh, this is a UV spectroscopy I, I have taken, and this is uh, the there will be a reflectance spectra exhibit a slight drop of the absorption age. And uh, for this uh, three thin oxide sample exhibit the character reflection band at low wavelength of around 350 nanometer. And to calculate the band gap, first of all, I take the reflectance uh, uh, data and I just use the Kubeka move function. Uh, and I just calculated the absorption, absorption where the absorption peak is around 200 to 400 nanometer, the maximum absorption of 290 nanometer, which is a 700 degree Celsius, where the 600 to 800 degree has a less uh, absorption. And you see the band gap I, cal I calculated 600 to 700 to 800 degree shows the 3.21 and 3.47 and 3.41 electron volt. In three samples, I think the 700 degree Celsius show, show a Good band back gap around 3.47 electron volt, and this is the the, the system uh, I use for the gas sensing uh, mechanism for the both uh, uh, propane and CO, and I use operating temperature 100 to 300 degrees Celsius, and the gas concentration from 0 to 500 ppm, and I use this formula for the sensing the measurement like the R0 represent the resistance in the air, and the R0 represent the resistance in the gas, and uh, this is the formula. So this is a sensing graph for the CO. Uh, for CO applied, while for applied for the resistance of the sensitivity and the concentration of the PPM at the three operating temperature. While you see the in this graph 600 and 700 to 800 uh, with 100 and 200 degrees Celsius operating temperature, the, the peak is very low. While the 300 degrees temperature operating temperature, where the electron get uh, excited and get in high temperature. And electron flow will be more. And the, when depends upon the where you see in the 100 to 200 300 ppm, there is very low concentration. So there will be a no good sensitivity. At the 500 ppm, it show a good sensitivity. While overall, if you see 700 degrees Celsius have a good uh, gas sensing uh, uh, results when uh, compared to the others because of the the uh, 
uh, band gap and uh, the the migration same as we saw the migration it was uh, like a regular and parallel so it was like almost medium so it was a good uh, result so that's why it show a good result when you in the research article it it was, it was more better than uh, uh, as the, the, the as the synthesis is done in a tin chloride the tin acetate has uh, shown a good uh, sensing results and this is for the c this is for the propane where the propane uh, also show the 7 degree celsius show a higher uh, sensitivity while a six, uh, while 600 and 700 has a low it's same as like co uh, has a it's also same like uh, exactly the resist sensitivity response and the concentration of ppm under the three operating temperature at conclusion, tin oxide nanoparticles are synthesized at different analytic temperatures using tin acetate from the four precipitation method. And the, the, uh, the crystalline size is around 7.60 for 600 and 8.8 .8 nanometer for 700 and 9.90 nanometer for 800 Celsius. For same analysis, we get a polarized spherical shape and particle size increase when the analytic temperature increases. The UV reflection show band gap energies of 3.21 and 3.41 and 3.47 electron volt for the following different analytic temperatures and uh, 700 degrees Celsius show a good sensitivity compared to 600 700 for the both the carbon monoxide and propane co carbon monoxide and propane while in the commercial sensor they are providing a, a separate sensor for c1 propane so in my case my one material provides a, can uh, detect a two gases at the same time thanks for the following uh, uh, professors in the Sinvesta and EPN and thanks for the connection and thanks for the opportunity for the opportunity from the CC for presenting. Thanks for okay. your attention. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, the time is over, but uh, if are there some short questions? If not, thank you very much for your time. Today's morning session now is over. Thank you very much for your participation. Okay. <laughs>